You bless us with your unfailing and unconditional love. We come to worship and praise our loving God and rejoice in your tender mercy towards us. Generous God, you pour blessings and grace upon us, forgiving us for our sin and shame. We come to worship and honour you, our merciful God, and rejoice in the wonder of forgiven and forgotten sin. God, in the beauty of your shalom and in the glory of your presence, all barriers are lowered. We come to worship and revere you, our glorious God, who enriches the lives of your people and speaks peace into the hearts of all his faithful. We ask that you inhabit our praises as we worship and speak to us through your, your word. We thank you for calling Jess to speak to us today and invite you to speak to us through her the words that you once spoken. God, we're mindful of our friends and family who are ill, whom we now commend to your compassionate regard. Comfort them, bless them, and ease their suffering. We beg for deliverance and submit that no healing is too hard for you, Lord, if it be your will. We believe in the power of the name of Jesus. We therefore pray that you bless our friends who are unable to worship with us for whatever reason. We thank you for gifting us with today's tithes and offerings. As we reflect more and more on all you have generously given to us, make us eager and willing givers of all the gifts you have poured down on us. We ask that you impress on our hearts the need to return a portion of our income to your church and its operations both here and abroad. We pray all these things in your name, Lord, the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Kids, your sermon search words are enemy, revenge, and love. The world says revenge is sweet. Do unto others before they do unto you. Don't get mad, get even. It's thought that Gandhi said, an eye for an eye will only make the whole world blind. As Christians, we turn to the Bible which says, love your enemies. To get started, I'm going to ask you a simple yet challenging question. We often talk about or have sermons on who is your neighbor, looking at the story of the Good Samaritan. But we don't often ask the question, who is your enemy? So now's your chance. Please don't answer out loud, but take a couple seconds to think for you personally, who is your enemy? The verse I mentioned uh, about loving your enemies is found in both Matthew and Luke's account of the gospel. Some of you might have had a name pop into your head straight away and you can identify with that passage and what it's telling you to do. But others of you might be more like me before I started preparing for this sermon where I just skimmed this verse. I thought, it doesn't matter to me. No one's trying to kill me as far as I'm aware. I'm not at war with anyone. I don't have an enemy. And so I found it really hard to take on board what these verses were saying because I just couldn't see how it applied to me. But there is nothing like preparing a sermon for God to take the opportunity to challenge you. There's, without knowing it, this is something that I've been struggling with for a long time, and I didn't realize until I looked a bit deeper into what the term enemy actually means, rather than just my perception of some medieval war. Good old Google defines an enemy as a person who is actively opposed or hostile to something or someone. <coughs> The Cambridge Dictionary goes a bit further and says, an enemy is a person who hates or opposes another person and tries to harm them or stop them from doing something. An enemy is something that harms something else. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary says, something harmful or one that is antagonistic to another. In this context, the term enemy becomes a lot broader because if you've ever had someone lie about you, you have an enemy. If someone has ever made a decision and not had your best interests at heart, you have an enemy. If anyone has ever hurt you, and not just physically but emotionally, you have an enemy. If you have ever had someone in your life that you just couldn't stand or who rubs you up the wrong way, you have an enemy. If there's someone who instantly annoys you, even without doing anything, you have an enemy. And all of, this, all of a sudden, these Bible verses are relevant and they are challenging. 
Now, for those of you who are visiting and maybe don't know, uh, at the start of the year, our church community made a commitment to read the entire Bible in a year. And each week we get sections from the Old Testament, the New Testament, from Psalms and Proverbs. And then on Sabbath we use the sermon to uh, look a little bit deeper into one of the topics or one of the stories or one of the themes. If you have been following the readings, you might be a bit confused at this point because neither that verse in Matthew or Luke is part of this week's readings. But bear with me, I promise it does tie into some of the stories that we have been reading. In fact, from this week's reading, there are four lessons. There are probably more than four, but I'm not going to make enemies by standing between you and basket lunch for too long. So we're going to focus on four. Um, themes for lessons that we can take away in terms of how we are to relate and interact with our enemies. And I have a quick confession, I am a bookworm. English Lit was one of my favourite subjects. This sermon is going to be heavily biblically text-based and so instead of having all the words up on the slide I'm just going to have the reference and I'd love if you haven't already get out your Bibles, hard copy, digital, um, so that you can follow along and read what I'm talking about for yourself. Lesson one comes from 1 Samuel 24, and the lesson is to spare your enemies. King Saul was hunting David. Saul wanted to kill David out of jealousy. Just as he'd gotten close to where David was, Saul had been called away because the Philistines were raiding Israel. Once he fought the Philistines, he then returns with 3,000 of his special troops to track David. Picking it up at verse 3, it reads, At the place where the road passes some sheepfolds, Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. But as it happened, David and his men were hiding further back in that very cave. Now's your opportunity, David's men whispered to him. Today the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into your power to do with you as you wish sorry, to do with as you wish. So David crept forward and cut off a piece of the hem of Saul's robe. But then David's conscience began bothering him because he'd cut Saul's robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this to my Lord the King. I shouldn't attack the Lord's anointed one, for the Lord himself has chosen him. So David restrained his men and did not let them kill Saul. After Saul had left the cave and gone on his way, David came out and shouted after him, my lord, the king. And when Saul looked around, David bowed low before him. Then he shouted to Saul, Why do you listen to the people who say I'm trying to harm you? This very day you can see with your own eyes it isn't true. For the Lord placed you at my mercy back there in the cave. Some of my men told me to kill you, but I spared you. For I said, I will never harm the king. He is the Lord's anointed one. Look, my father, at what I have in my hand. It's a piece of the hem of your robe. I cut it off, but I didn't kill you. This proves that I'm not trying to harm you and that I have not sinned against you, even though you have been hunting for me to kill me. May the Lord judge between us. Perhaps the Lord will punish you for what you are trying to do to me, but I will never harm you. David, with 600 men, so about triple what we have here, were all hiding together in a cave as Saul and his army approached. Nature called and Saul had to step away. He was alone, he was distracted, he was vulnerable, and he was in the very same cave that David was hiding in. This is the perfect situation for David to be rid of his enemy. He has the motive, he has the opportunity, he has the weapon. Let's face it, he has a track record for killing people, and he has the encouragement. David's men, his friends, said to him, This is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as it seems good to you. But... Proverbs 15:22 says, Without counsel, plans go awry, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. In theory, seeking advice and encouragement from others when deciding on a course of action is a good thing, but we need to be careful about the company we keep and the motivation of the advice that we receive. The men believed it was, or wanted it to be, God's will for David to kill Saul. After all, Saul had been trying to kill David. The men knew David was to be the next king, but they also knew he wouldn't become king while Saul was still alive. 
A bit earlier in Proverbs 14.12, it says, there's a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. We need to make sure that the counsel we receive lines up with God's leading, and that is where our conscience comes into play. Upon being encouraged by his friends, David cut the hem of Saul's robe to demonstrate he had the power and the opportunity to kill, but chose not to. According to a little bit of research that I did, the hems of Jewish robes are different to what we consider to be a hem. It's not just a piece of fabric that's tucked up and stitched to stop fraying. Uh, a hem was a symbol of a person's status, a symbol of their authority. So in particular, kings would have very ornate, um, intricate design features that were called hems. It's suggested that removing the hem of a man's garment was equivalent to removing part of his personality or his identity, which was the ultimate insult. We're told that David regretted cutting the robe. His conscience was bothering him. Cutting the robe was wrong because it made the king look bad. It was wrong because it showed a lack of respect. It was wrong because Saul was still God's anointed. David recognizes Saul was God's anointed, one who was set apart, chosen by God to fulfill a certain purpose. He was under protection of God's law, and David was obliged to be faithful to the law of God, even if he felt the person was unworthy of such a position. David upheld God's commands above seeking personal revenge. Saul acknowledges this. Sorry to make you flick back and forth, but back to 1 Samuel in verse um, 16. He calls back to David and he says, is that really you, my son David? Then he began to cry and he said to David, you are a better man than I am, for you have repaid me good for evil. Yes, you have been amazingly kind to me today, for when the Lord put me in a place where you could have killed me, you didn't do it. Who else would let his enemy get away when he had him in his power? May the Lord reward you well for the kindness you have shown me today. So, lesson number one from this week's readings, spare your enemies. Let's have a quick think about what that might look for us, look like for us. Maybe it's not returning evil for evil. Maybe it's to try to view people as God views them. Maybe it's about listening to your conscience, making sure that you do what you know is right, even if the people around you are saying something else. Or maybe it's all of the above. All right, lesson number two, a couple chapters over. This is Saul and David's next encounter. Saul seems to have forgotten the first encounter um, because he's decided that he's going to keep tracking David and try to kill him again. Picking up at verse three, Saul camped along the road beside the hill of Hakila and Jesh near Jeshimon where David was hiding. When David learned that Saul had come after him into the wilderness, he sent out spies to verify the report of Saul's arrival. David slipped over to Saul's camp one night to look around. Saul and Abner, the commander of his army, were sleeping inside a ring formed by slumbering warriors. David and Abishai went right into Saul's camp and found him asleep with his spear stuck in the ground beside him. Abner and the soldiers were lying asleep around him. God has surely handed your enemy over to you this time, Abishai whispered to David. Let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear. I won't need to strike twice. No, David said, don't kill him, for who can remain innocent after attacking the Lord's anointed one? Surely the Lord will strike Saul down some day, or he will die of old age or in battle. The Lord forbid that I should kill the one he has anointed. But take his spear and that jug of water beside his head, and then let's get out of here. So David took the spear and jug of water that were near Saul's head. Then he and Abishai got away without anyone seeing them or even waking up, because the Lord had put Saul's men into a deep sleep. David climbed the hill opposite the camp until he was a safe distance. Then he shouted down to the soldiers and to Abner, Wake up, Abner. Who is it? Abner demanded. Well, Abner, you're a great man, aren't you? David taunted. Where in all of Israel is there anyone as mighty? So why haven't you guarded your master, the king, when someone came to kill him? This isn't good at all. I swear by the Lord and that you and your men deserve to die because you failed to protect your master, the Lord's anointed. Look around. Where's the king's spear and the jug of water that were beside his head? Saul recognized David's voice and called out, Is that you, my son David? And David replied, Yes, my lord, the king. 
I thought stealing the spear and the jug was just a random what's lying around that's convenient that I could take as a symbol that I was here. Um, but actually, there's a bit of symbology behind it. The spear was, uh, it served as Saul's scepter. So it was his protection, but again, it was also a status of his kingly authority. Uh, and then the water jug represents a life-sustaining resource. He's in the middle of the desert. He needs that water to survive. So not only is there this level of symbolism, but David also demonstrates that. He got close enough to kill him. He had the opportunity again, and he didn't take it. Verse 21 says, Then Saul confessed, I have sinned. Come back home, my son, and I will no longer try to harm you, for you valued my life today. I have been a fool and very, very wrong. And David replied, The Lord gives his own reward for doing good and for being loyal, and I refuse to kill you even when the Lord placed you in my power, for you are the Lord's anointed one. Now may the Lord value my life even as I have valued yours today. So our lesson number two for today is to love your enemies. Loving your enemies isn't about showing affection. You don't have to be best buddies with your enemy. Saul and David definitely weren't. Even after this, this is the last recorded meeting of the two before Saul dies. It does mean that we need to show genuine concern for their well-being. And the key here is that we need to value their lives. We need to recognize people's value in God's eyes. Repeatedly in the New Testament, we're told to love one another. But if it's not talking about affection, what does that mean? It might be time for a reminder about what love is. Let's flick into the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 13. First Corinthians 13 verse 4 says, Love is patient and kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. We often hear this passage in the context of marriage, but today, we're talking about our enemies. So I'm going to read it again, and I want you to have that in mind. Showing love to our enemies means being patient and kind, not envying, not boasting, not being proud. Love doesn't dishonor our enemies. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Showing love means not delighting in evil, but rejoicing with the truth. It means we always protect, we always trust, we always hope, we always persevere. Love never fails. This is a hard one. Personally, I hate conflict and I will do almost anything to avoid it. So for me, that means when someone uh, offends me, upsets me, the easiest thing to do is just cut them off and have nothing to do with them. But that's not really showing love, is it? There's, don't get me wrong, there is healthy distance, and sometimes you do need that, but you've got to do it in love, not just um, completely cutting someone off. The final aspect to this lesson is trusting God to fight for your cause and to rely on his timing. God is God, we are not. He can handle revenge. He can handle getting even and paying back our enemies. He will bring ultimate judgment and justice. And because God's judgment sometimes surpasses human comprehension, it might not look like how we imagined it would, but that doesn't mean that God isn't fighting for us. If we seek revenge, it means we don't trust God to take up our cause. We need to learn to wait on God to work out the situation. Moving on to lesson number three, disarming our enemies. In between chapter, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 24 and 26, and these two times where Saul and David met, there's another story, and that's the story of Abigail. It's one of my all-time favorites, maybe because it's women in the Bible, and I, liked, I feel like I can relate to those stories. Um, I recently was given this book, which is from 1940, to me, that's really special. To some of you, maybe it's not that old, but I love it. <laughs> um, so I would like to read to you the summary of this story um, as it's written in here. It says, 
there was a plateau above which rose several mounds whose ruins hold all that is left of Moan, Ziph, and Carmel. This is where Nabal and his wife Abigail lived when David was an outlaw in the surrounding desert. On the fat land, Nabal grazed his 3,000 sheep and his herd of 1,000 goats. The future king of Israel at this romantic period of his life was hiding from Saul and gathering his supporters in caves and deserts. He and his merry men lived by a levying, sorry, lived by levying a kind of tax on the sheep farmers of the Fertile Plateau. In return for protection against the lawless Bedouin, the farmers were only too willing to pay the outlaws so much grain at harvest time or so much wool at shearing. It paid the farmers to have David as a friend rather than an enemy. Those who refused his protection found independence very expensive. When David heard that Nabal was sheep shearing, he sent 10 young men to remind him in a polite but pointed manner that during the past season, no hurt had come to his shepherds and his sheep. Give, I pray thee, whatsoever cometh to thine hand unto thy servants, concluded the messengers. In other words, we have looked after you for a year. What was it worth to you? Nabal was a coarse-grained drunkard. It is a remarkable fact that there are few instances of impoliteness in the Old Testament. Nabal's reply is one of them, for drink coarsens a man's nature and degrades his manners. Who is David? asked Nabal bluntly. It was a deliberately rude and provocative question. When David heard of it, he simply said, get your swords, and they set off to slay Nabal and his household. The Bible then tells us that a servant came to Abigail and told her what her husband had done, and she wasted no time at all in getting together some food, some drink, and to take it to David, sort of as a peace offering, sort of as payment, but essentially to try to resolve the situation that her husband had caused. The Bible tells us that Abigail was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. Abigail was also a peacemaker. Her calmness, wisdom, generosity, humility, tact, and kind words cooled David's anger. So much so that he later married her. Her gentle response diffused the situation, and in this way she was able to disarm her enemy. Let's think back to the video that we watched at the start. In that situation, things escalated very quickly. How differently would it have gone if the first lady just said sorry? or if the second lady had used a different tone. Repaying for evil for evil isn't just a vicious cycle because every time there's retaliation, it actually amplifies. On the other hand, there's a saying that goes, one good turn deserves another. Or another version is, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. It's easiest for people to give what they receive, but if what we receive is bad, as Christians, we're called to go against that. Romans 12, 17 to 21 advises, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do your part to live in peace with everyone as much as possible. Dear friends, never avenge yourselves. Leave that to God. For it is written, I will take vengeance. I will repay those who deserve it, declares the Lord. Instead, do what the scriptures say. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink, and they will be ashamed of what they have done to you. Don't let evil get the best of you, but conquer evil by doing good. The Bible stance is countercultural. It says that I, you, we need to go against the grain and break the pattern. And in this way, we will disarm our enemies. All right. Lesson number four. I feel like forgiveness is something that we talk about a lot. Um, we do it in Sabbath school. I think we have a really good grasp on it as a theme, but today I'm connecting it to a passage that we normally keep for communion. And you might have already made this connection, and if so, awesome. But for me, it was a bit of a mind-blowing moment. I'd like you to turn to John 13, and we'll read the account of the Last Supper. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. 
It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God, so he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. Down to verse 18. I'm not saying these things to all of you. I know that the ones that I have chosen, but this fulfills the scripture that says, the one who eats my food has turned against me. I tell you this beforehand, so that when it happens, you will believe that I am the Messiah. Now Jesus was deeply troubled and he exclaimed, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at each other, wondering whom he could mean. The disciple Jesus loved was sitting next to Jesus at the table. Simon Peter motioned to him to ask, who is he talking about? So that disciple leaned over to Jesus and asked, Lord, who is it? Jesus responded, it is the one to whom I give the bread I dip in the bowl. And when he had dipped it, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. And when Judas had eaten the bread, Satan entered into him. Then Jesus told him, hurry and do what you're going to do. Even though it's a fairly well-known passage and I've read it lots of times before, there was something that just clicked for me this time. Jesus knew that Judas was the one who was going to betray him. Which means that when Jesus was washing the feet, he knew that Judas was the one who was going to betray him. It doesn't say that Jesus washed all the disciples' feet except Judas, or that Jesus loved all his disciples through his ministry and right to the end except for Judas. Jesus knew what was going to happen. Jesus knew Judas' heart. Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him. And despite this, Jesus still served him. That just blows my mind. Sometimes when we do foot washing as a church, it's a little bit awkward washing other people's feet, even when they're your own friends and family. But imagine having to wash the feet of your enemy, knowing that they're going to do something before they've even done it. That would just be a whole other level of awkward. Sometimes we need to put our own needs, our own pride aside and serve others, even those, especially those, who might betray or hurt us. There is a massive element of forgiveness here, and the symbolism of cleansing through foot washing isn't lost on me. John 15, 12 and 13 says, I command you to love each other in the same way that I have loved you, and here is how to measure it. The greatest love is shown when people lay down their lives for their friends. Jesus knew that the disciples didn't fully understand what was going on. We were told earlier that they thought Judas had slipped out to pay for the food or maybe he'd gone to make a donation seeing as he handled all the disciples' money. But in reality, Jesus knew that soon they were going to realize that he was the betrayer. Also, soon they were going to see Simon Peter deny Jesus. So he's getting it early here, telling them to love each other, knowing that that's going to be harder in the near future. Jesus sets the example. In Romans 5, 10, it's, oh, sorry, in Romans 5, it says, Now most people would be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is... A, sorry, let me start again. Now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. This is the ultimate act of forgiveness. There's a quote that says, Revenge is sweet, but to a calm and considerate mind, patience and forgiveness is sweeter. Forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting. Forgiveness doesn't mean that you're saying what the other person did was okay, but forgiveness is letting go of the burden, not carrying around the grudge, being released from the weight and the bitterness of resentment. Chances are that by dwelling on it, you're actually the one who is being hurt the most. It's logical, but hard in practice. You can't move on until you let go. Only through forgiving our enemies can there be healing for us and for them. So this week's readings 
have given us four very different um, examples of how to interact with our enemies. Um, but they all give us lessons that maybe you'll apply one, maybe you'll apply two, maybe you'll apply all four. As much as we might wish we did, we'll never have control over how people treat us, but we do have control over how we respond. There was a section of Psalms this week that really stood out to me as a commitment in terms of the where to from here. I think if you're up for the challenge, this is a good thing to keep in our minds and to align our lives with. It starts in chapter 118. My enemies did their best to kill me, but the Lord rescued me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. Then in Psalms 119, it says, Happy are people of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord. Happy are those who obey his laws and search for him with all their hearts. They do not compromise with evil and they walk only in his paths. You have charged us to keep your commandments carefully. Oh, that my actions would consistently reflect your decrees. Then I will not be ashamed when I compare my life with your commands. As I learn your righteous laws, I will thank you by living as I should. I will obey your principles. Please don't give up on me. I think it's pretty safe to say that by now, everyone in here has at least one person that you can think of who sort of fits into the category of enemy, or is someone that you need to spare, love, disarm, and forgive. So I'm going to finish by leaving a prayer on the screen, and before the worship team get up, if you could just give us a few seconds for private prayer, um, read through the prayer, and I would like you to substitute the name of the person in the blank space. Let's pray. Dear Lord, please let our joy be full. May the healing begin right now. Forgive us for our many excuses. Please go down deep and expose the bitterness within. Thank you for the examples of how we are to respond when unfairly treated. And thank you for the Holy Spirit who gives us the power to overcome the temptation of revenge. May a revival of love and forgiveness sweep through our church. In Jesus' name, amen.